Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Let me look in the camera here and welcome everyone joining us online, outdoor in our courtyard, our Discovery Northwest, Discovery Cal State Bakersfield, wherever you're watching. Come on, celebrate with us if you're excited to be in God's house. Amen. We're beginning a new series that I'm so excited about called The Names of God. There is so much power in the names of God. And some of you may not even know that God actually has a lot of different names. Here's what you need to know. This is what I'm hoping this series, you guys, is that these names of God that we see and we're going to study, that they would become, and they're not, they're not titles and they're not platitudes. God reveals himself to his creation throughout history, throughout the pages of the Bible, to reveal himself, uh, his character and his nature. They're not titles. It reveals who he is and how he actually wants to relate to us as his creation. I love this verse in Isaiah chapter 52, verse six, kind of a theme verse for us. It says, I will, God says, I will reveal my name to my people and they will come to know its power. Okay, so, so God wants you to know him by name, not just by title, but that you would actually know his name. And I believe this is actually how God uh, wants to reveal himself to you. And as he does reveal, and as we're studying this series and we go through the names of God, my hope is as God reveals himself personally to you, that you would respond by taking steps closer to his name. You'd respond by taking steps closer to him. Cause you can put up a wall and you go, Oh, I don't know about that. I'm not ready for that part of him. I'm not ready for that yet. And that's how, but God wants to lead you by revealing who he is to you. Does you imagine, that make sense you guys? Let me give you a few verses in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, about the names of God. Actually, it's all over your Bible. It talks about the names of God. You may have just overlooked it a little bit. Proverbs chapter 18 says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. So when I know his name, I actually can run to it and find safety and shelter under the covering of that name. It's been on my crisis and my situation. I know my God is my provider. My God is my protector. I can run to that name like a fortified tower and find safety under his covering. Psalm chapter 86, verse 11 says, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, meaning a loyal heart, one that isn't, has some of my affection in the world and some of it for God, an undivided heart that I may, look what he says, fear your name. The Bible talks a lot about fearing the name of God, actually. I think this is something that is like lost in our culture and our society. We don't like fearing nobody, man. We don't, there's like not a healthy fear of authority anymore, a fear of parents, a fear of mom and dad. How many grew up where there was some fear of mom and dad in the house? You know what I'm saying? Okay. This is, and this isn't like a terror of judgment of like a fear of God. Don't misunderstand. God does not want you to live in terror of who he is, that kind of fear. He wants you to live in reverence in awe of his majesty, of his power, that you should, you should fear, you should reverence in awe the, the, the mightiness of your father in his paddle, of your mom and her chancla. I don't know which kind of house you grew up in, okay? But there is, a, there is a healthy reverential respect for the power, the might, the authority. That's the kind of fear. In fact, all throughout the scriptures, attached to the fear of the name of God, the Bible says that when you do, you will be blessed and protected by God. Attached to this reverential awe, respect, and honor for the name of God. Psalm 29 and 2, it says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. See, the better you understand God's names, the more you will worship him. The better you see and experience God's manifestations of his names in your life, the more you'll actually ascribe glory to him. Let me put it this way, write it down. God's names are given to us to reveal his nature to us. God wants to reveal himself to us, to, to show us how to relate to him, and I'm convinced that the, the only, only by embracing a revelation of God's name in your life are we even able to lead a faithful, godly life when God reveals who he is to us and how we respond to that name. It's through his names that we can develop a deeper relationship with God. Each of God's names reveal an aspect of his character, providing us with understanding about who he is and what he desires for us. In fact, when Jesus was teaching the disciples the secret to his prayer life, when they asked him, how do we pray like you? You got a relationship with the Father that's 
awesome and works the very first words of the prayer he taught his disciples. Matthew 6, 9. Maybe you overlooked it, but look at it again with me. He says, pray like this, you guys. This is the secret to my prayer life. Our Father in heaven, first words, may your holy name be honored. Some of your translations say, hallowed be thy name. You know, what's a hallowed? You know what I mean? I don't know what a hallowed is. Here's what, here's what that means, hallowed. May your name be worshiped, exalted, honored, and adored. Jesus says, this is the secret to the prayer life. This is my inner chamber. You want to have a relationship with God like me? This is how it begins. May your name be holy and honored and worshiped. See, people may try to use God's names, but they don't know God's names the way God defines himself. They actually, this actually shows up in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Ten Commandments? So the first commandment is, you have no other gods before me, Right? And then the second commandment is, you shall not make an image or an idol to bow down and worship it. But the third commandment, Exodus chapter 20, the third commandment, the first three are all about our relationship with God. The third commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse seven says, you shall not misuse the what? You shall not misuse the name. There's, there, no, 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 there's, this, is a, this is to be honored. This is to be revered. There is power in this name. God says in the 10 commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord your God will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So how do we use his name the way God uses his name and know his name the way that God has revealed his name to us? Here's what I want to do. This is going to be a long series, you guys. We're going to study this for 10 weeks. Today, I'm going to just set the foundation. I'm going to give you the foundational names of God. There are three names of God that actually are the, the theologians call it the foundational names. There's three foundational names of God. And, and, and then I'm going to share with you like, how should then we respond to his name? Because God, look, God wants to reveal himself to you to reveal his nature, but not so that you could just know. And I, I'm going to take some complex principles of the word of God. We're going, to get, we're going to study the Word of God today. I'm going to give some theology to you, and I'm not going to make it confusing. I promise everyone here, I'm going to try to make it applicable and understanding to every person, but it's not so that you could just tickle your mind or something or grow in your knowledge of God's Word. It's God will reveal Himself to you in His name and who He is to you so that you can relate to God. So you're going to have a choice of how you respond to the name of God. Since he has revealed himself this way to us, what should our response to his power, to his name be? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. There's three foundational names, three foundational names. Here they are. Write it, write it down with me. Number one is this. The first name we see of God in the scriptures is Elohim. Someone say Elohim. Okay. We sing about that today. Elohim, the strong creator God. He is the supreme God. The, the all-powerful God, the, the majestic, the mighty, the strong creator God. This is the, the, the name of God we see first given in, in the Genesis account. It's used 35 times in, the, in Genesis 1, 1 through the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. Other names come later in his personal revelation of his character throughout his word. But let me show you Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where this name shows up in the very first verse of the Bible. And this verse is packed with so much. There has been like books written about Genesis 1-1, you guys. There's been whole like theological discussion. Let me show it to you. Genesis chapter 1-1. It simply says, in the beginning, Elohim, God, created the heavens and the earth. And oh my goodness, is this packed with some with some theology. Let me let me just break down a few things of Elohim here. In the beginning, God was. So we see that God is timeless and omnipresent, that he exists above time and outside of time. He is the beginning and the end. He is timeless before it all. In the beginning, God was already, okay? In the beginning, God created. So he is separate from creation. He's not a created being. He is the beginning and has created all things. The biblical, the the theological word is transcendent. But he's not just transcendent, above it all, his creation in time. He is imminent, dwelling amongst it and inside of it. He is here, now. He's there. 
He's everywhere, okay? It, it, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23 and 24, it explains this nature of Elohim. He says it like this, God speaking through the prophet. He says, am I only a God nearby? Elohim Mikarov declares the Lord. This is Hebrew, by the way. That's, that's, your Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And not a God far away, Elohim Meratok. Who can hide in the secret place? So I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do I not feel the heaven and the earth, declares the Lord? The Lord is everywhere at all times. He sits enthroned above it all. Elohim is the strong, supreme, timeless, mighty creator of all things. Here's what you need to know about, about this Elohim, about Elohim. God is in control. He's in control. Your job as a follower of Jesus is not to outwit or to outplay or to outsmart God. It's not to try to figure out your own personal destiny for yourself. God has already drawn it and mapped out your life. And I got news for you. It's good. He's got plans of a future and a hope for you. Elohim, you need to just fully trust him. You don't, you don't need to create it. Elohim, the creator, God has already created it. You don't need to force it. Elohim, the strong one, has already set it up. You don't need to go find it because Elohim, the personal ever-present God, will reveal it to you as you seek him. Elohim, the strong creator God, sits above it all. He is in control. This is why God reminded Abram and Sarah when they were doubting him in Genesis chapter 18 and 14. He said, is anything too difficult for the Lord, Elohim, I stand above it all. Can I not do anything I want to do? Can I not meet every need? They were doubting that they would have a child in old age. And he says, is anything too difficult for God, Elohim? Jesus said it like this in Luke 137. For with God, nothing will be impossible. This is who he is. He is the supreme creator. He sits enthroned above it all, before it all, after it all. He is above and in control. Elohim, the great, the awesome, the supreme, the mighty, the all-powerful God. Can somebody just shout praise to God? That's his foundational name we see is Elohim, his first foundational name. The second foundational name is Jehovah. Someone say Jehovah. That is the relational name. God. This is the most frequently used uh, term or name of God in the Old Testament. It's used 6,519 times. If Elohim is God's creative and powerful name, Jehovah is God's personal name. When studying Elohim, we learn of his power and his presence. But when we talk about Jehovah, we're talking about his person and his character. See, Elohim is the side of God who created the heavens and the earth, but Jehovah is the side of God that relates to his creation personally. But check this out. Listen, a person can believe in Elohim without knowing Jehovah. In fact, plenty of people believe in God, but they don't know the God in whom they believe. Come on, are you tracking with me, you guys? And they believe in Elohim, but they don't know the present God. Jehovah is the God who personally reveals himself to us. But check this out. <laughs> God often, all throughout the scriptures, when he reveals himself to us by name, it's often times of crisis and turmoil and tragedy and trouble that God comes on the scene and wants to be known by you that you don't need to doubt or fear or, or be afraid because God is in control. He is Jehovah. The first time God reveals himself to an individual as Jehovah is found in the burning bush story in Exodus chapter three to Moses. Look at this with me, Exodus chapter three. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And ask, they ask me, well, what's his name? Who's this God? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. The, the translation there is Jehovah or Yahweh that we sing about today, depending on how you wanna translate it. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So, so in the actual Hebrew writing though, when he says, I am who I am, 
the, there was no vowels in the Hebrew uh, literature in writing. So, so the actual writing is Y-H-W-H. That's why you see that sometimes written out. And then later on, because, you know, the Westerners love vowels, we put the A and the E in there and kind of pronounce it Yahweh. And that's where Jehovah comes from. Some people get all mixed up on this. It's like, well, what's his name? Listen, the Spanish church calls him Jesus. We call him Jesus. It don't matter. He knows his name, okay? Some of y'all get all hung up on that. I don't know his name. His name is Stop, okay? God knows his name. That's not, that's not what's most important is how you pronunciate the name, okay? The original Hebrew is Y-H-W-H. And I, I think what's cool is that um, uh, scholars and rabbis have noted that these letters, Y-H-W-H, they represent breathing sounds and, and aspirated consonants. The, the, when pronounced without those intervening vowels, the A's and the E's, it sounds like breathing. So Y-H for inhaling and W-H for exhaling. How you actually pronounce it in Hebrew is yahiwahe, yahiwahe. And it's a very breathy, like, like, like it's a yahiwahe. It's, it's a breathy word. There seems to be a connection between the names of God and the fundamental act of human existence, breathing. That, that the, the baby's first cry, his first breath speaks the name of God. The cry that you let out in your heart because of despair and crushing and discouragement when you don't even have the words to say, your very cry utters the name of God. Even some of you that feel you're so far away from God, some of you are mad at God. And some of you just, just, you know, you're running from him. He has never left you. Every uttered word you breathe the name of God. Jehovah is the present God, the relational God, the God who knows you, who is walking with you. And this is so powerful and important to how God wants to be known by you. And the enemy knows this. The devil knows this. I'm going to show you something in the creation account because Satan is so crafty, you guys. Look what it says in in Genesis chapter 3. Throughout Genesis chapters 2 and 3, God is referred to Lord God or Jehovah Elohim. Elohim references his creative powers and Jehovah references his relational authority to mankind. Here's, look what it says though. Watch the crafty serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animals. The Lord God, Jehovah Elohim had made. So he said to the woman, did God, did Elohim really say? Satan intentionally omitted the name that referred to God's relational nature to his creation. See, a lot of people use God's name today the same way devil, the devil did in the garden, and it's using his name in vain. They don't attach his character and his nature to his name, and it only perpetuates what the devil did in the garden of Eden. Chaos is what it perpetuates when we don't, when we don't attach the character to his name. So he drops the Jehovah. He don't mind you knowing him as Elohim. Look what he, And then what happens next? Look at this. She goes, did Elo, he says, did Elohim really say? You must not eat from the tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden, but God, Elohim, she, she dropped the Jehovah too. See, Satan's whole tactic, his whole goal was to get Eve to drop Jehovah, to drop the Elohim. She just, he doesn't mind you. The devil doesn't mind you getting a little bit of religion. The devil does not mind you coming to church and worshiping God and singing songs. The devil does not mind you fixing your marriage and getting your habits right. And he doesn't mind any of that. He minds when you have a personal relationship with God. That's what he minds. He don't mind you. You can go to, you can talk about Elohim. You can talk about God and how awesome he is and how powerful he is. You can go on the job and talk about how awesome and powerful he is. But when Jehovah is inserted in the picture, now you have a personal relationship and personal is powerful. She says, you must not eat. But Elohim said, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you'll die. See, when Jehovah's brought in the conversation, he becomes personal and interactive, a God who is guiding and leading and loving and caring. And the enemy wants you to drop the relationship. See, when we talk about this impersonal being off in a distance, Elohim, because when you talk about Elohim, he's God creator, he can be a distant God. Jehovah is what brings him close. It brings him in relationship. And when he's distant, it's easy to twist things 
and add things. If the enemy can just keep your relationship with him distant, he can twist the word of God. That's what he did in the garden. Did God really say? And then she started getting all twisted. And, said, well, uh, and then she added to his words, we can't, even, we can't even touch it. Where'd that come from? God didn't say that. That came because the enemy twisted her relationship with God. So we talk about this impersonal being off of the distance. It's, it's, it's so important we bring him close. Jehovah brings him close. He's right here with us intimately, knowing us. Look what Moses says of his relationship with Jehovah God. Exodus chapter 33. Are y'all still with me? Y'all getting something out of this, you guys? Okay. Exodus chapter 33 says, And Moses went into the tent. The pillar of cloud will come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Did you know you serve a God that speaks? And God wants to speak to you. Maybe not how I'm, I'm talking to you. He wants to speak to your spirit and in spirit. God wants to be known to you. He wants to reveal himself to you. In fact, Moses' relationship with God is just a type and a shadow. The apostle Paul says that that glory that Moses had was a fading glory, and the glory we have is an ever-increasing glory, a glory to glory, ever transforming to the nature of God. That this is just a shadow, a lesser form of the relationship we get. We can actually talk, commute, have a relationship with God like Moses had. And the Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one would speak to a friend. I know there's a lot of you here that want to have this kind of relationship with God. You want to hear from God. Jesus actually, he, he equated the relationship he would have with us with that of a shepherd and his sheep. He said, my sheep listen to my voice and they follow me. I lead them out and they don't recognize there's a stranger's voice and they don't even recognize it. They follow my voice. And I know there's a lot of you that want this kind of relationship with God. You want to know him relationally and personally where he reveals himself to you in such a way that you actually step out to the revelation of God, that he's leading and guiding and showing and you step out and you follow him. You want to hear him. But why don't you? Why, why don't we? Why is it that our desires don't line up with what's real, the actually happening in our life? Because I know a lot of you really do, and you love him, but you don't know him like, like this, the way that some of these Bible verses and people, well, the way that they know him. Let me give you a few reasons why I think. I think there's two main reasons why you don't have a relationship with Jehovah, the relational God. You might know Elohim, you know about God and his power and he's supreme, but you don't have the revelation personally of God who leads you out. Okay, here's two, two big, the biggest reasons I see. Number one, we're too busy. We're just simply too busy. You can't develop a good relationship with anyone if you're too busy for that relationship. And the reality is this is chronic in our culture. We just got too much going on, way too much going on. You're too, we're too busy. We, we got, but you don't understand, Pastor. I got, man, I got, I got kid. I got, I, I got to take them to this game. I got to take them to this practice. And then I take them to this lesson. Who told you you have to raise your kids like that? Who told you that you were the chauffeur for your kids and that was the way to best raise them? That they were to learn, that that's what, like, like you're, you're too, you got to carve out some space if you really want to know the voice of God and to know him relationally this way, for him to be revealed to you in your life, you got, you're, just, you're too busy. You got to cut some stuff out. Psalm 127 verse two says, it's senseless for you to work so hard early in the morning until late at night. And some of you are grinding and going, you're, you're running hard, you're running fast. Listen to me, just, you can be successful and miss it. The devil would love to make you successful. Rich and successful, good business, successful. The devil don't mind you being successful. The devil does not mind you being healthy. He doesn't mind you having that stuff and that kind of lifestyle. He doesn't mind it at all. What he minds is you having a personal relationship with God. That's what he minds. And the reality is we're too busy. Here's the second biggest reason I think is we're too distracted. There's just so much going on around us in our life. It's like, 
I liken it like a football stadium. You know, in the football stadiums, when the, when the crowd's going crazy and they're cheering and, and, and you can't have a conversation with someone next to you. This is what the culture around us, the noise and the distractions and, and, and the entertainment and, and social media and, and the drama, just all this stuff is just crowded. It's distracting the, the voice of God. But in the very same stadium, if there was no one else there, because of the bowl-like structure, you can carry a conversation with someone across the whole stadium in a speaking voice if you just removed the distractions. There's a lot of times that Jesus wanted to pull people close. They, and, and, the, and I believe that the, there was a lot of people that intended to and had good intentions to, but they made excuses of why they couldn't. Because I'm hearing you right now. You just don't understand, Pastor. I got, I, my, I just, I'm just so busy. I got this, I got that, I got that. And here's what Luke chapter 14 says, because Jesus invited some people close. And they all alike began to make, what'd they make? Excuses. Excuses. I just, but you don't understand, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I, I'm the only one who's making an income in my family. I got to work two jobs. But you don't understand, you know. Uh, I, I, I got I to I do this. I got to do that. They all began, look at the excuses. These actually excuses were pretty common. They weren't like, I, I got a party to go to, you know. I got, you know, I can't right now. I'm t- making too money on, on selling drugs. I can't. No, they were, there wasn't any of that. It wasn't that kind of, it was, look what it says. The first said, I had just bought a field and I got to go see it. It's a business deal. Ah, oh, geez, I got this business deal. You know, this is a busy season for my business, Jesus. I just, you know, maybe later, maybe later in a different season, I won't be as busy. Please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. I just, you know, I, there's, there's a new direction. It's a new season. I just got this new thing happening. I'll come back around to it. It's just not a good time, Jesus. And still another said, I just got married. Man, I got, I got relationships I got to invest into. I just got married. I, I, just, I got some, I got kids. I just had a baby. Oh, I just got these little kids. You know, two kids are hard, pastor. They're hard. What would it be like if you just kind of if you truly want this kind of relationship with God, if you want to just not know Elohim, but get to know Jehovah, the relational God, the revelatory God who speaks, leads, guides, dwells among you, you're going to have to let go. You're going to have to get unbusy and undistracted. What would it look like if you just did that? If you just kind of looked at your life and you, and you looked at those distractions, I would tell you, there's probably two things that need to happen to these distractions and the busyness in your life. Some things, the first thing is this, some things just need to be eliminated, guys. Some things, if you were really to assess it, you're, you're, you, you'd, you'd have to come to some conclusion of like, this needs to stop. I just need to stop this. I'm going to get my kids signed up for one thing, not three. I'm just going to stop because like, I want them in the house of God. I mean, it doesn't matter if they know piano and they're not going to go to the NBA anyway. So dang it, I'm just going <laughs> to, what am I doing with this year round stuff? You think you're setting them up? You're setting them up for life without God. Something's got to get eliminated. And then, and then maybe, maybe a few things do. But I would say a lot of things got to get limited. Just limited. So that, I can, so that I can hear him. Be with him. Relate to him. These, this is his foundational name. We'll study a lot of his names, Jehovah, and, and what, how he reveals himself to us. Elohim, the strong creator God. Jehovah, the relational God. Number three, his third foundational name is Adonai. The God who rules, he is he's, he, Adonai, master, owner, Lord. This is, this is what his name means. Like Elohim, Adonai is used in the plural form of God because our God is, is a plurality. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Elohim and Adonai are actually plural forms of a name. Adonai is found over 400 times in the Bible. He is the God who rules Overall, Psalm 97 verse 5 says, the Lord, he is the Lord of all the earth. So he's just not the creator. Check it out. He's the owner. He owns it. You don't own anything. I don't own anything. He, nobody owns anything. It's all his. He owns it all. Psalm 50 verse 10 says, every beast, God says, for every beast of the forest is mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all God's. He is master over it all, Lord and owner and ruler over it all. The first time God's name Adonai was used in Genesis chapter 15 with Abram. 
when you look at this and you consider the names that, are, that Abram uses, it gives some pretty cool insight to this, this story that, you, that you, some of you have read before in the Bible. Genesis chapter 15. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord, Jehovah, came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh, Lord God, Adonai, Jehovah, this is the first time that's used this. He's saying, oh, master God, oh, owner God, oh, ruler God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. You're going to see here that submission is a powerful tool in your relationship to an all-powerful God. And how God responds to the willing, submissive heart. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians today have settled for Jehovah without experiencing the full power of Adonai. To experience all that God has for you as ruler, as master, as owner of your life, you got to knowingly and willingly surrender to him. That means he gets to call the shots. He's the final say on the decisions. This is what Abram is doing to God. He says, master God. Owner God, ruler God, look how God responds to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside. And he said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able even to number them. And then he said, so shall your offspring be. Verse eight. But he said, again, Adonai, Jehovah, master, ruler, owner, God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? See, one of the, one of the problems today is that we have too many Christians who want God to get them to heaven, but don't want God to own them on earth. But unless you get to this place where you willingly confess God as Adonai, your experience of his self-revelation as Jehovah is going to be limited. You may even hear his word and say, God's promises are yes and Amen. But the fulfillment of his promises in your life is often tied to your surrender to him as Adonai. Owner, Lord, master. God must have the right to own your life if he's gonna take responsibility to do something with your life. Verse 18 says this. God says, on this day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. See, when Abram surrendered to God as Adonai, that's when he received the promise of a child. He got further revelation and, and he got the intimate covenant established. He even later on, you see if you continue reading, he got a new name changed from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many nations. Abraham's submission to God as master, ruler, owner, it opened a path for him to hear more from God, for God to get more to him and for the covenant to be made. See, a lot of people are content with just the God of creation. In fact, a lot of people are content with a lot of the names of God, but they push back on this one the most, Adonai. I mean, owner, master? Ooh, come on, talk to me about my provider. I'd like God to give me some riches according to his glory. You know what I mean? Give me, give me my provider, God my provider, God my strength, God my, but, but, but God my master? I don't know. Preach something else there. Hold on. This is the one that, that, that is pushed back. But let me say it like this. Surrendering to God as Adonai is the key to experience the revelation of Jehovah. It's the key. It's the password that unlocks God to be able to express and reveal and manifest himself in your life. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. See, acknowledging God and surrendering to him as Adonai are two totally different things. Adonai comes with obedience. Adonai comes with sacrifice. Adonai comes with a heart that follows God and recognizes he's the owner and he calls the shots in my life. See, running your life independently is like calling him Lord, Lord, but not doing what he says. Until we address the Adonai, the lordship issues in our life, God's revelation to us and in us and his use of us is going to be limited. You're not going to see the deeper levels and the deeper things that God wants to show you because he only takes people there that have willingly surrendered to him as master, as Lord. See, believing in God isn't enough to access your authority that comes through lordship of Jesus Christ. Calling on the name of God isn't enough. 
Let me, let me, Romans chapter 10, you guys have heard this and I've said this verse a lot. Let me break down the meaning of this verse in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It's, the Apostle Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with your heart you believe and you're justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, are there two prerequisites to getting saved? Is it confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart? Because there's a problem here, Paul, because there's a whole bunch of other scriptures that say there's only one thing you need to do, and that is faith. Believe in Jesus, and you are saved. So is this a contradiction? Or is the, this scripture trying to reveal something else to us? So let me tell you, the, the, the answer is found in the context here of Romans chapter 10. Paul is writing to people who are already Christians. So he's not necessarily showing people how to get saved for the first time. He's showing people who are already saved how to be delivered and be freed. Let me say it like this. You must believe on the Lord Jesus to go to heaven, but you must confess the Lord Jesus Christ to get heaven down to you on earth. See, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when you believe, His righteousness immediately becomes your righteousness. You are saved. Yet, when you make a public confession of Jesus as Lord, as Master, as Adonai, as Ruler, you receive His deliverance in the here and now. You are saved. That's what this word means when He says saved. That's what it means. It means He delivers you now. You'll have an opportunity to do that actually today. What a great opportunity is, is the public confession that Jesus is Lord through baptism. It, it's, it's that sign of saying, you know, publicly, I'm, I don't just, you know, talk about God. He's not just a strong creator God. No, I've surrendered. I'm dead to myself. And I'm born again in Christ. That's what baptism represents. The Lordship of Jesus. Every one of these names, these foundational names, and we're going to get into more names as the week goes on. Elohim, Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh, whatever you want to, however you want to pronounce, I don't care. Jehovah and Adonai. They actually, they're all God, but they, they actually reveal the Godhead very beautifully. Let me show it to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. In the message paraphrase, it says it like this. May the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, that's Adonai, master, owner, ruler, Lord, the extravagant love of our Father God, Elohim, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, the relational God who walks alongside you, the paraclete Holy Spirit, be with all of you. And these three foundational names are hidden. The Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So then, how should we respond to God's name, as he's revealed it to you today, as God has revealed himself to you, then how should we respond to his name? Now, this is the key. The key is not just knowing his names, but allowing the, the revelation of God to lead you, that you would take steps towards his lead. Where is he taking you? What, what does his name mean? And what is it? What, what should I do? How should I respond to his name? There are three things I think you should do that God is calling you and inviting you to do based on who he is. Elohim, Jehovah, and Adonai. Real quickly, the first thing I think we need to do to respond to his name is worship his majesty. And I'm not just, I'm not talking about like singing a song kind of worship. I'm talking about the, the awe of the supreme, majestic awesome, timeless God that we would in our hearts, our hearts would bow and melt before a God who has in control of it all, that we would worship the majestic nature of God. That we come back to this place of awe, of reverence, of a bowed heart. We'd worship his name. That we would, number two, that we would relate to him personally. That we wouldn't just you know, get a little bit of church and call it good. So you comfortable with talking about God, Elohim, the strong God and this creator God, but not knowing him in my life, in my crisis, like inviting him personally into your pain, into your home, into your job, like inviting God to know him and relate to him personally, Jehovah, the relational God. 
And then to surrender to him completely as master, as owner, Lord, ruler of it all. This is his name. How are you going to respond to it? He says, I will reveal my name to my people that they may come to know its power. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.